Greetings and welcome to In-Depth, I'm DK Rosta. It is International Peace Day at a time when peace may seem more of a concept to some. To speak to ways we can address structural violence, we are joined by the inaugural Daria L. and Eric J. Wallach, Professor and Director of Peace and Justice Studies, Associate Professor of Africana Studies, Affiliate of Education and Advisory Committee Member for the International and Global Studies, Public Policy and the Civil War Era Studies at Gettysburg College, Dr. Hakim Mohandas Amani Williams. Welcome, Dr. Williams. That is a mouthful of an introduction, but you're joining us from Accra, Ghana, right now, where Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day 2022 is being observed. And I want to ask you, looking back, where you are now, did you think that, did you see that in your future? And describe some of the steps that you would have taken to get where you are today. Thank you. Yeah, um, good evening. Greetings to the viewers, and thank you to give for having me on your show. Um, no, I, I don't think I could have envisioned as a kid growing up in Laventille that I would have led this particular kind of life. Um, people around me in Laventille, um, I think, spoke wonderful things into my life. I just wasn't sure of the exact trajectory. Um, so I'm not entirely surprised that, that I was a diligent, hard worker, still am, um, but certainly could not have foreseen where life would have taken me. So if you're looking at International Peace Day and looking at the work that you're doing, uh, let's start from the bottom, base. Define peace, define violence for us first. Right, so peace and violence, those are rather polysemous terms and they mean many things to many people. Um, I think it is why it is, it is difficult across many disciplines to craft particular kinds of interventions because people conceptualize violence in different kind of ways. I'll give you an example. So I did a seven month dissertation of my doctoral study study in Trinidad. And I spent seven months at a secondary school looking at violence and the ways in which students, parents and different folks in that community conceptualize violence. I quickly recognized that people had one particular way of understanding violence. And so in the end, I call that discursive violence because whatever the kids were doing, that was violence. But let's say, for example, a teacher beating a student that wasn't considered to be violent, which I do consider to be within the ambit of violence itself. And so if people have different definitions of violence um, and we have many issues around violence in Trinidad, it makes sense that some of our interventions would not work because it's a rather emaciated, narrow understanding of what violence is. Um, and so all that to say as a preface that it's very difficult to, to define peace and violence. And so for me, peace falls into two buckets. There is negative peace and there is positive peace. Negative peace, which is necessary but insufficient, is about the cessation of direct violence, right? So let's say two countries are at war it's very difficult to speak about positive peace when people are still literally fighting against each other. So negative peace is probably causing some kind of truce so that the violence in the streets can actually stop. Positive peace is about addressing structural violence. It's creating an environment where everybody can thrive and be their best selves. And that takes a lot of work. And looking at that work, and I, I like the fact that you, it seems as though you introduce a qualifier how do you make that nuance speaking to structural violence? Right, so, so structural violence, is, so I understand why people focus on direct violence, right? So I hit you a slap or I cuss you out. Um, those things are easy to identify. Structural violence takes a rather complicated analysis to understand the complexity and the breadth and depth of the violences um, that, that create that network of structural violence. So for example, the educational system in Trinidad is, is, is still a relic of colonialism, right? We have a kind of bifurcated dual educational system where you have the top tier schools where the supposedly best students go to, right? Most of those schools were created in the colonial era. 
right? And so we understand that Trinidad's class stratified society is reinforced by our educational system by and large. So to me, our educational system plays a role in educational structural violence in Trinidad. And so when we talk about violence on the streets, we have to think about an educational system for decades that that told many children that they were uneducable, that they were unworthy of investment, that the dancey, that the stupid. Imagine where those thousands of children, where do they end up when they internalize those messages? It comes back to porn society. So somebody looking at a gunman on the road, I just don't look at the gunman on the road and I'm not justifying what that person is doing. That person ought to be held accountable. But that's not the end all and be all of the analysis. We have to ask ourselves, how did that person get there? People in prison, if you really dig deep, you realize there's lots of intergenerational trauma, right? You recognize an educational system that wrote them off, right? So there, there are many issues that, that play a part when we see direct violence in front of us. And that's why I am more so interested in structural violence. What are the institutions? What are the, the different processes, international, regional, national, community level? that influence the violences that we see in front of us. But Doc is all well to talk and talk is cheap as some people say, you know, but how does studying peace help to mitigate or end violence, both structural and other, and other, and other forms? Right. So that, that's a good question, DK. For me, I tell folks to work on peace in any which way that they can, right? But everybody could be a, a plumber, a lawyer, a doctor. We need all kinds of people, which means we need all kinds of intervention for peace. For me, peace begins and starts with me on the inside here, right? The kind of community I grew up with in Laventille, I, I grew up with both promise and peril. And growing up in intense poverty, um, has left its scars, and I've had to work on that to be a better human being, a better partner, a better son, better brother. Um, and so I recognize that I can't teach nobody about peace if I am not working on it for myself. And that, that is a forever project. Until they are dead, I will have to work on inner peace. Because it's not a point where it's not destinational, it's processual. You don't just show up and say, oh God, I have peace and I'm good to go. I mean, we humans, you know, we are up to air, and so therefore we always have to work on it. So to me, that's that's the first stage of peace is working on oneself. Because if there's inner turbulence, it's we're gonna lash out at other people, at our partners, at our children, right? And it's it's gonna reverberate throughout society. And then, then of course, if people have um, the skills to intervene in other kinds of ways, then I say go for it that you could be an artist in your community, right? Helping kids on the streets, creating after school programs, teaching them, teaching them art so that they're not spending time on the street corner, perhaps being um, lulled into gang warfare, or whatever the case may be, right? You have teachers who are working hard day in and day out, trying to show kids, give them the knowledge that they need, but trying to make them good Trinbegonian citizens. Right? Then, of course, you have your policy makers, people who are really trying to create a kind of structural impact. Right? To me, all of those levels are important if we are to create peace in Trinbago. And again, it's not necessarily destinational. It's something that we have to keep on working at. And you know, the way I understand it is that Trinbago and the Caribbean is within a vortex where we experience slavery, colonialism, and indentureship. It has warped sort of relationships between human beings and our environment that lasted hundreds of years so there is no way that we are going to to address that deeply and cure that in a short 60 years of independence right so we need both an urgency and a consistency and a dedication but also a kind of patience knowing that this is not going to be wrought overnight so in terms of dealing with that patience, we ask you to bear with us for just a bit. While we take a short break, we return speaking to Dr. Hakim Williams. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking with Director of Peace and Justice Studies at Gettysburg College, Dr. Hakim Williams. And we're speaking, with, we're very happy to be speaking with you as you are in Accra, Ghana at this point in time. 
But looking at addressing structural violence, I really like the appreciate the fact that you've spoken to communities so much, even when talking about your some of your earliest memories, there were individuals in your community, in your air, speaking life. How important is community work to all of this? So if, we, if we're looking at community as the, as the microcosm of global situations, how important is that narrative, that person speaking to you, saying that you can, you even will? Right, yeah. Um, thank you for asking about that. Um, to me, community is, is the bedrock. And there are different kinds of communities, right? So growing up in Laventil, I would have people saying, hey, look, look, Dr. Williams Jr., you know? Um, and of course, I knew who Dr. Eric Williams was, but that, bigging me up in that kind of way, I was like, okay, this, this poor scrawny kid from Laventil perhaps can one day become a Dr. Williams of his own. Right. I remember my grandfather didn't didn't have much money on my father's side, didn't have much money, but he was always impeccably dressed. I don't know how the heck he used to wear shirts and tie any hot trim that summer. But anyway, always looking good. And he would always see me. And when he would see me, he would stoop down to my level and he would give me a few dollars and get tears in his eyes. And he would say, grandson, one day you are going to be a scholar. And I didn't quite grasp the full understanding of what it meant to be a scholar. But my grandfather in community speaking those words into my life, I think made a really big difference. And here today, indeed, I am, I am a scholar and, and Dr. Williams. So to extrapolate from my own story, you know, I come back, the, the pandemic intervened, but before the pandemic, I used to come back to Trinidad once, twice a year to do workshops with parents and students and community leaders. Um, in Laventil and environs and similar communities around conflict resolution. I would teach them restorative circles and, and encourage them to then teach that to other people so as to pass on these skills. And I did that for free. I didn't charge anybody, right? Because I saw it as my duty to come back and, and help my community, right? Um, and I know that those communities, um, they are under great duress. Um, and every year they're like, Dr. Hakim wants to come back and give me more skills. Um, and so that is rather encouraging for me. And I think, I think many people look to the government to create the, the sustained change and peace and justice that we're looking for. But we have to recognize that, that and I'm not excusing any kind of government here because I don't align myself with any uh, um, government in Trinidad. But I think that people in community need to recognize that a government, even if they had all of the resources at their disposal, they don't know the community like you do. Right. So communities have to mobilize, have to make sure that that the children on the street, that they're not hungry, they're not staying or too late. If, you know, a mother working two jobs, you know, taking your child, you know, watch your child for her, you know. And I think if more communities were to take on that particular kind of ethic, um, I think it would do well for Trinidad to begin. Of course, I, I don't want to make it seem as if peace in Trinidad starts and ends in community because there are some important things that the government has to be doing. Right. There are certain things internationally that are kind of out of our control. Right. For example, there's a proliferation of small arms. Trinidad doesn't participate in that production, but certainly we know small arms accompany the drug trade. Um, and so when the drugs come to Trinidad and they leave, we know that the guns stay. And that is leading to more gang warfare and further destabilizing impoverished communities. So I certainly recognize that there are complex influences, international and regional, that play a role in the various violences that we see in Trinidad. No, I, no, I, and thank you for that. I don't want us to. I don't want it to seem as though we're trying to operate in um, a vacuum, as it were. So I, even like quoting somebody like Peter Tosh, I don't want no peace. I need equal rights and justice. Is peace the peace that you that you that you're working towards? Not positive peace. Is that sort of peace devoid of conflict? Um, so from the field of conflict studies, conflict is inevitable. Um, what is not inevitable is, is, is managing conflict violently. Um, we can learn, we can learn skills, we can unlearn. Um, because I think with the way in which I grew up, I didn't get the skills that I have now for nonviolent conflict resolution, right? I've learned now the power of 
of, of my words. I've learned the, the power of, of investing and spending time with people. Um, and, and so all of, all of that takes work, right? So I've been in therapy and, and all that good stuff and to trying to, trying to be a better practitioner. So conflict, conflict will always happen. But I believe we can teach people and give people the skills to resolve conflicts in a kind of nonviolent fashion, right? Um, and that is why I'm against things like beating children because it makes no sense to me. Like you're trying, you're trying to convey a moral good message to a child, but you're beating them. A, a child who is growing up, so first of all, the brain is only fully developed around age 25. An eight-year-old child, that's a mixed message we're sending to them. I want you to be a good person, but I'm beating it to teach you that lesson. That'll make no sense, right? Um, so I think we do have to find nonviolent ways of interacting with each other. And I know that many parents are frustrated and, and sometimes you pick up a spot and you want to bust, bust a lash in a child's heel. Um, but I do believe it's possible. And I see the parents I work with when I give them the skills. They're like, yeah, Dr. Hakim, I've been using these skills and it's hard but I'm seeing a difference in my family, in my marriage, in my church, in my community. Um, and so um, I, I, think, I think it is, it is possible to do so. Um, I may have strayed from, from your question. It's later here in Ghana here. So I hope I answered your question. You could remind me if I hadn't answered all of this. Yes, man, and that actually reminds me of the Love Over Everything movement where, it's, where they state, as you do, that conflict is inevitable, but violence is a choice. And looking at that choice, there is work that is going to be happening in the not too distant future. There's a conference, and I heard that you were championing to have it here in Trinidad and Tobago. Give us a little information about it. Thank you. Yes, thanks for asking about that. So the International Peace Research Association, it is the largest consortium globally of peace researchers and educators. It was created in 1964, and every two years, there's a conference somewhere in the world. The 29th iteration of this conference is going to be happening in Sweet Trinidad and Tobago. It is the first time that it will be occurring in the Caribbean region. And I'm so excited that we get to show the world what the Caribbean and what Trinbago um, are made of, right? We know that there have been um, wonderful thinkers, writers, activists, artists that have come out of that that have made global impact. Um, and so I think Trinidad and Tobago, the crossroads of the Americas, is a wonderful place to have a sort of Pan-American, Pan-Africanist conference around peace. It's gonna be in May of next year to be held at the Hilton Hotel. All right, and is, is, there, a call, is there a call for papers? How can people engage with it in the last 30 seconds we have? Yes, absolutely. The website is ipra2023.org. Um, call for papers. It's due October 31st. I would love to see my Trimbegonian people submit your proposals, whether it's to do a workshop, a performance, or show some art, or sell a book around peace, violence, justice. Um, we need all of our voices, and we definitely want to have a major youth influence. And so help encourage youth and bring them to this peace conference. And we want to thank you for your voice, Dr. Hakim, or Hakim Mohandas Amani Williams, Director of Peace and Justice Studies at Gettysburg College. And on behalf of the entire TGT News team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Rostar. Thank you so much for joining us.